Chapter One of Coffee and Repartee by John Kendrick Bangs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One the guests at mrs smithers high-class boarding-house for gentlemen had assembled as usual for breakfast and in a few moments mary the dainty waitress entered with the steaming coffee the mush and the rolls the schoolmaster who by the way was suspected by mrs smithers of having intentions and who for that reason occupied the chair nearest the lady's heart folded up the morning paper and placing it under him so that no one else could get it observed quite genially for him it was very wet yesterday i didn't find it so observed a young man seated halfway down the table who was by common consent called the idiot because of his views in fact i was very dry curious thing i'm always dry on rainy days i am one of the kind of men who know that it is the part of wisdom to stay in when it rains or to carry an umbrella when it is not possible to stay at home, or, having no home, like ourselves, to remain cooped up in stalls, or stalled up in coops, as you may prefer. "'You carried an umbrella, then?' queried the landlady, ignoring the idiot's shaft at the size of her elegant and airy apartments, with an ease born of experience. "'Yes, madam,' returned the idiot, quite unconscious of what was coming. "'Whose?' queried the lady, a sarcastic smile playing about her lips. "'That I cannot say, Mrs. Smithers,' replied the idiot serenely. "'But it is the one you usually carry.' "'Your insinuation, sir,' said the schoolmaster, coming to the landlady's rescue, "'is an unworthy one. The umbrella in question is mine. It has been in my possession for five years.' "'Then,' replied the idiot, unabashed, "'it is time you returned it. "'Don't you think men's morals are rather lax in this matter of umbrellas, Mr. Whitechoker?' he added, turning from the schoolmaster, who began to show signs of irritation. "'Very,' said the minister, running his finger about his neck to make the collar, which had been sent home from the laundry by mistake, set more easily. "'Very lax. At the last conference I attended, some person, forgetting his high office as a minister in the church, walked off with my umbrella without so much as a thank you, and it was embarrassing, too, because the rain was coming down in bucketfuls. "'What did you do?' asked the landlady sympathetically. She liked Mr. Whitechoker's sermons, and beyond this he was a more profitable boarder than any of the others, remaining home to luncheon every day and having to pay extra therefore. "'There was but one thing left for me to do. I took the bishop's umbrella,' said Mr. Whitechoker, blushing slightly." "'But you returned it, of course,' said the idiot. "'I intended to, but I left it on the train on my way back home the next day,' replied the clergyman, visibly embarrassed by the idiot's unexpected cross-examination. "'It's the same way with books,' put in the bibliomaniac, an unfortunate being whose love of rare first editions had brought him down from affluence to boarding. "'Many a man who wouldn't steal a dollar would run off with a book,' I had a friend once who had a rare copy of Through Africa by Daylight. It was a beautiful book, only twenty-five copies printed. The margins of the pages were four inches wide, and the title page was rubricated, and the front piece was colored by hand, and the seventeenth page had one of the most amusing typographical errors on it. Was there any reading matter in the book? queried the idiot, blowing softly on a hot potato that was nicely balanced on the end of his fork. "'Yes, a little. But it didn't amount to much,' returned the bibliomaniac. "'But, you know, it isn't as reading matter that men like myself care for books. We have a higher notion than that. It is as a specimen of book-making that we admire a chaste bit of literature, like Through Africa by Daylight. But as I was saying, my friend had this book, and he'd extra illustrated it. He had pictures from all parts of the world in it, and the book had grown from a volume of one hundred pages to four volumes of two hundred pages each. "'And it was stolen by a highly honourable friend, I suppose?' queried the idiot. "'Yes, it was stolen, and my friend never knew by whom,' said the bibliomaniac. "'What?' 
asked the idiot, in much surprise. Did you never confess? It was very fortunate for the idiot that the buckwheat pancakes were brought on at this moment. Had there not been some diversion of that kind, it is certain that the bibliomaniac would have assaulted him. It is very kind of Mrs. Smithers, I think, said the schoolmaster, to provide us with such delightful cakes as these free of charge. Yes, said the idiot, helping himself to six cakes. Very kind indeed. Although I must say they are extremely economical from an architectural point of view, which is to say they are rather full of pores than of buckwheat. I wonder why it is, he continued, possibly to avert the landlady's retaliatory comments. I wonder why it is that porous plasters and buckwheat cakes are so similar in appearance, and so widely different in their respective effects on the system, put in a genial old gentleman, who occasionally imbibed, seated next to the idiot. I fail to see the similarity between a buckwheat cake and a porous plaster, said the schoolmaster, resolved, if possible, to embarrass the idiot. You don't, eh? replied the latter. Then it is very plain, sir, that you have never eaten a porous plaster. To this the schoolmaster could find no reasonable reply, and he took refuge in silence. Mr. Whitechoker tried to look severe. The gentleman who occasionally imbibed smiled all over. The bibliomaniac ignored the remark entirely, not having as yet forgiven the idiot for his gross insinuation regarding his friend's edition de luxe of Through Africa by Daylight. Mary, the maid who greatly admired the idiot, not so much for his idiocy, as for the aristocratic manner in which he carried himself, and the truly striking striped shirts he wore, left the room in a convulsion of laughter that so alarmed the cook below stairs that the next platterful of cakes were more like tin plates than cakes, and as for Mrs. Smithers, that worthy woman was speechless with wrath. But she was not paralyzed, apparently, for reaching down into her pocket she brought forth a small piece of paper on which was written in detail the account due of the idiot. "'I'd like to have this settled, sir,' she said with some asperity. "'Certainly, my dear,' replied the idiot, unabashed. "'Certainly. Can you change a check for a hundred? "'No, Mrs. Smithers could not.' "'Then I shall have to put off paying the account until this evening,' said the idiot. "'But,' he added, with a glance at the amount of the bill, "'are you related to Governor McKinley, Mrs. Smithers?' "'I am not.' she returned sharply. My mother was at Partington. I only asked, said the idiot, apologetically, because I am very much interested in the subject of heredity, and you may not know it, but you and he have each a marked tendency toward high tariff bills. And before Mrs. Smithers could think of anything to say, the idiot was on his way downtown to help his employer lose money on Wall Street. End of chapter 1。Chapter 2 of Coffee and Repartee。Do you know, I sometimes think, began the idiot opening and shutting the silver cover of his watch several times with a snap, with the probable, and not altogether laudable, purpose of calling his landlady's attention to the fact, of which she was already painfully aware, that breakfast was fifteen minutes late. "'Do you really?' interrupted the schoolmaster, looking up from his book with an air of mock surprise. "'I am sure I never should have suspected it.' "'Indeed,' returned the idiot, undisturbed, by this reflection upon his intellect. I don't really know whether that is due to your generally unsuspicious nature or to your shortcomings as a mind-reader. There are some minds, put in the landlady at this point, that are so small that it would certainly ruin the eyes to read them. I have seen many such, observed the idiot suavely. Even our friend the bibliomaniac, at times, has seemed to me to be very absent-minded. And that reminds me, doctor, he continued, addressing himself to the medical boarder, what is the cause of absent-mindedness? That, returned the doctor ponderously, is a very large question. 
absent-mindedness generally speaking is the result of the projection of the intellect into surroundings other than those which for want of a better term i might call the corporally immediate so i have understood said the idiot approvingly and is absent-mindedness acquired or inherent here the idiot appropriated the role of his neighbor that depends largely upon the case replied the doctor nervously some are born absent-minded some achieve absent-mindedness and some have absent-mindedness thrust upon them as illustrations of which we might take for instance i suppose said the idiot the born idiot the borrower and the man who is knocked silly by the pole of a truck on broadway precisely replied the doctor glad to get out of the discussion so easily he was a very young doctor and not always sure of himself or put in the schoolmaster to condense our illustrations if the idiot would kindly go out upon broadway and encounter the truck we should find the three combined in him the landlady here laughed quite heartily and handed the schoolmaster an extra strong cup of coffee there is a great deal in what you say said the idiot without a tremor there are very few scientific phenomena that cannot be demonstrated in one way or another by my poor self it is the exception always that proves the rule and in my case you find a consistent converse exemplification of all three branches of absent-mindedness he talks well said the bibliomaniac sotto voce to the minister yes especially when he gets hold of large words i really believe he reads replied mr whitechoker i know he does said the schoolmaster who had overheard i saw him reading webster's dictionary last night i have noticed however that generally his vocabulary is largely confined to words that come between the letters a and f which shows that as yet he has not dipped very deeply into the book what are you murmuring about queried the idiot noting the lowered tone of those on the other side of the table we were conversing ahem about began the minister with a despairing glance at the bibliomaniac let me say it interrupted the bibliomaniac you aren't used to prevarication and that is what is demanded at this time we were talking about ah uh, about er tut tut ejaculated the schoolmaster we were only saying we thought the er the uh, that the what are the first symptoms of insanity doctor observed the idiot with a look of wonder at the three shuffling boarders opposite him and turning anxiously to the physician i wish you wouldn't talk shop retorted the doctor angrily insanity was one of his weak points it's a beastly habit said the schoolmaster much relieved at this turn of conversation well perhaps you are right returned the idiot people do as a rule prefer to talk of things they know something about and i don't blame you doctor for wanting to keep out of a medical discussion i only asked my last question because of the behavior of the bibliomaniac and mr whitechoker and the schoolmaster for some time past has worried me and i didn't know but what you might work up a nice little practice among us it might not pay but you'd find the experience valuable and i think unique it is a fine thing to have a doctor right in the house said mr whitechoker kindly fearing that the doctor's manifest indignation might get the better of him that returned the idiot is an assertion mr whitechoker that is both true and untrue there are times when a physician is an ornament to a boarding-house times when he is not for instance on wednesday morning if it has not been for the surgical skill of our friend here our good landlady could never have managed properly to distribute the late autumn chicken we found upon the menu tally one for the affirmative on the other hand i must confess to considerable loss of appetite when i see the doctor rolling his bread up into little pills or measuring the vinegar he puts on his salad by means of a glass dropper and taking the temperature of his coffee with his pocket thermometer nor do i like and i should not have mentioned it save by way of illustrating my position in regard to mr whitechoker's assertion nor do i like the cold eager glitter in the doctor's eyes as he watches me consuming with some difficulty i admit the cold pastry we have served up 
to us on Saturday mornings under the wholly transparent alias of hot bread. I may have very bad taste, but in my humble opinion, the man who talks shop is preferable to the one who suggests it in his eyes. Some more iced potatoes, Mary, he added calmly. Madam, said the doctor, turning angrily to the landlady, this is insufferable. You may make out my bill this morning. I shall have to seek a home elsewhere. Oh, now, doctor, began the landlady in her most pleading tone. Jove, ejaculated the idiot. That's a good idea, doctor. I think I'll go with you. I'm not altogether satisfied here myself, but to desert so charming a company as we have here had never occurred to me. Together, however, we can go forth and perhaps find happiness. Shall we put on our hunting togs and chase the fiery, untamed hall room to the death this morning? Or shall we put it off until some pleasanter day? Put it off, observed the schoolmaster persuasively. The idiot was only indulging in persiflage, doctor, that's all. When you have known him longer, you will understand him better. Views are as necessary to him as sunlight to the flowers, and I truly think that in an asylum he would prove a delightful companion. There, doctor, said the idiot. That's handsome of the schoolmaster. He couldn't make more of an apology if he tried. I'll forgive him, if you will. What say you? And strange to say, the doctor, in spite of the indignation which still left a red tinge on his cheek, laughed aloud and was reconciled. As for the schoolmaster, he wanted to be angry, but he did not feel that he could afford his wrath, and for the first time in some months the guests went their several ways at peace with each other and the world. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Coffee and Repartee This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Coffee and Repartee by John Kendrick Bangs Chapter 3 There was a conspiracy in hand to embarrass the idiot. The schoolmaster and the bibliomaniac had combined forces to give him a taste of his own medicine. The time had not yet arrived which showed the idiot at a disadvantage, and the two boarders, the one proud of his learning and the other not wholly unconscious of a bookish life, were distinctly tired of the triumphant manner in which the idiot always left the breakfast table to their invariable discomfiture. It was the schoolmaster's suggestion to put their tormentor into the pit he had heretofore digged for them. The worthy instructor of youth had of late come to see that while he was still a prime favorite with his landlady, he had nevertheless suffered somewhat in her estimation, because of the apparent ease with which the idiot had got the better of him on all points. It was necessary, he thought, to rehabilitate himself and a deep-laid plot to which the bibliomaniac readily lent ear, was the result of his reflections. They twain were to indulge in a discussion of the great story of Robert Ellesmere, which both were confident the idiot had not read, and concerning which they felt assured he could not have an intelligent opinion if he had read it. So it happened upon this bright Sunday morning that as the boarders sat them down to partake of the usual restful breakfast, as the idiot termed it, the bibliomaniac observed, I have just finished reading Robert Ellesmere. Have you indeed, returned the schoolmaster with apparent interest. I trust you profited by it. On the contrary, observed the bibliomaniac, my views are much unsettled by it. I prefer the breast of the chicken, Mrs. Smithers, observed the idiot, sending his plate back to the presiding genius of the table. The neck of a chicken is graceful, but not too full of sustenance. He fights shy, whispered the bibliomaniac gleefully. Never mind, returned the schoolmaster confidently. We'll land him yet. Then he added aloud, unsettled by it. I fail to see how any man with beliefs that are at all the result of mature convictions can be unsettled by the story of Ellesmere. For my part, I believe, and I have always said, I never could understand why the neck of a chicken should be allowed on a respectable table anyhow, continued the idiot, ignoring the controversy in which his neighbors were engaged, unless for the purpose of showing that the deceased fowl met with an accidental rather than a natural death. In what way does the neck, 
demonstrate that point queried the bibliomaniac forgetting the conspiracy for a moment by its twist or by its length of course returned the idiot a chicken that dies a natural death does not have its neck wrung nor when the head is removed by the use of a hatchet is it likely that it will be cut off so close behind the ears that those who eat the chicken are confronted with four inches of neck very entertaining indeed interposed the schoolmaster but we are wandering from the point the bibliomaniac and i were discussing is or is not the story of robert elsmere unsettling to one's beliefs perhaps you can help us decide that question perhaps i can returned the idiot and perhaps not it did not unsettle my beliefs but don't you think observed the bibliomaniac that to certain minds the book is more or less unsettling to that i can confidently say no the certain mind knows no uncertainty replied the idiot calmly very pretty indeed said the schoolmaster coldly but what was your opinion of mrs ward's handling of the subject do you think she was sufficiently realistic and if so and elsmere weakened under the stress of circumstances do you think or don't you think the production of such a book harmful because being real it must of necessity be unsettling to some minds i prefer not to express an opinion on that subject returned the idiot because i never read robert l's never read it ejaculated the schoolmaster a look of triumph in his eyes why everybody has read elsmere that pretends to have read anything asserted the bibliomaniac of course put in the landlady with a scornful laugh well i didn't said the idiot nonchalantly the same ground was gone over two years before in burroughs great story is it or is it not and anybody who ever read clink's books on the non-existent as opposed to what is knows where burroughs got his points burroughs story was a perfect marvel i don't know how many editions it went through in england and when it was translated into french by madame tournay it simply set the french wild great scott whispered the bibliomaniac desperately i'm afraid we've been barking up the wrong tree you've read clink i suppose asked the idiot turning to the schoolmaster yes returned the schoolmaster blushing deeply the idiot looked surprised and tried to conceal a smile by sipping his coffee from a spoon and burroughs no returned the schoolmaster humbly i never read burroughs well you ought to it's a great book and it's the one robert elsmere is taken from same ideas all through i'm told that's why i didn't read elsmere waste of time you know but you noticed yourself i suppose that clink's ground is the same as that covered in elsmere no i only dipped lightly into clink returned the schoolmaster with some embarrassment but you couldn't help noticing a similarity of ideas insisted the idiot calmly the schoolmaster looked beseechingly at the bibliomaniac who would have been glad to fly to his co-conspirator's assistance had he known how but never having heard of clink or burroughs either for that matter he made up his mind that it was best for his reputation for him to stay out of the controversy a very slight similarity however said the schoolmaster in despair where can i find clink's books put in mr whitechoker very much interested the idiot conveniently had his mouth full of chicken at that moment and it was to the schoolmaster who had also read him that they all the landlady included looked for an answer oh i think returned the worthy hesitatingly i think you'll find clink in any of the public libraries what is his full name persisted mr whitechoker taking out a memorandum book horace j clink said the idiot yes that's it horace j clink echoed the schoolmaster very virile writer and a clear thinker he added with some nervousness what if any of his books would you specially recommend asked the minister again the idiot had by this time risen from the table and was leaving the room with the genial gentleman who occasionally imbibed the schoolmaster's reply was not audible i say said the genial gentleman to the idiot as they passed out into the hall they didn't get much the best of you in that matter but tell me who was clink anyhow i never heard of him before returned the idiot 
"'And Burroughs?' "'Same as Clink. "'Know anything about Ellesmere?' chuckled the genial gentleman. "'Nothing, except that it and Pigs and Clover came out at the same time, and I stuck to the pigs.' And the genial gentleman, who occasionally imbibed, was so pleased at the plight of the schoolmaster and of the bibliomaniac, that he invited the idiot up to his room, where the private stock was kept for just such occasions. And they put in a very pleasant morning together. End of chapter 3「This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Coffee and Repartee by John Kendrick Bangs. Chapter 4 The guests were assembled as usual. The oatmeal course had been eaten in silence. In the idiot's eye there was a cold glitter of expectancy, a glitter that boded ill for the man who should challenge him to controversial combat and there seemed also to be judging from sundry winks passed over the table and kicks passed under it an understanding to which he and the genial gentlemen who occasionally imbibed were parties as the schoolmaster sampled his coffee the genial gentleman who occasionally imbibed broke the silence i missed you at the concert last night mr idiot said he yes said the idiot, with a caressing movement of the hand, over his upper lip. I was very sorry, but I couldn't get around last night. I had an engagement with a number of friends at the athletic club. I meant to have dropped you a line in the afternoon telling you about it, but I forgot it until it was too late. Was the concert a success? Very successful indeed. The best one, in fact. We have had this season, which makes me regret all the more deeply your absence returned the genial gentleman with a suggestion of a smile playing around his lips indeed he added it was the finest one i've ever seen the finest one you've what queried the schoolmaster startled at the verb the finest one i've ever seen replied the genial gentleman there were only ten performers and really in all my experience as an attendant at concerts I never saw such a magnificent rendering of Beethoven as we had last night. I wish you could have been there. It was a sight for the gods. I don't believe, said the idiot, with a slight cough that may have been intended to conceal a laugh, and that may also have been the result of too many cigarettes. I don't believe it could have been any more interesting than a game of pool I heard at the club. It appears to me said the bibliomaniac to the schoolmaster that the popping sounds we heard late last night in the idiot's room may have some connection with the present mode of speech these two gentlemen affect let's hear them out returned the schoolmaster and then we'll take them into camp as the idiot would say i don't know about that replied the genial gentleman i've seen a great many concerts and i've heard a great many good games of pool but the concert last night was simply a ravishing spectacle. We had a Cuban pianist there who played the orchestration of the first act of Parsifal with surprising agility. As far as I could see, he didn't miss a note, though it was a little annoying to observe how he used the pedals. Too forcibly, or how? queried the idiot. Not forcibly enough, returned the imbiber, he tried to work them both with one foot. It was the only thing to mar an otherwise marvellous performance. The idea of a man trying to display Wagner with two hands and one foot is irritating to a musician with a trained eye. "'I wish the doctor would come down,' said Mrs. Smithers anxiously. "'Yes,' put in the schoolmaster. "'There seems to be a madness in our midst.' "'Well, what can you expect of a Cuban, anyhow?' queried the idiot." The Cuban, like the Spaniard, or the Italian, or the African, hasn't the figure which is necessary for the proper comprehension and rendering of Wagner's music. He is by nature slow and indolent. If it were easier for a Spaniard to hop than to walk, he'd hop and rest his other leg. I have known Italians whose diet was entirely confined to liquids. 
because they were too tired to masticate solids. It is the ease with which it can be absorbed that makes macaroni the favorite dish of the Italians, and the fondness of all Latin races for wines is entirely due, I think, to the fact that wine can be swallowed without chewing. This indolence affects also their language. The Italian and the Spaniard speak the language that comes easy, that is soft and dreamy, while the Germans and Russians, stronger, more energetic, indulge in a speak that, even to us, who are people of an average amount of energy, is sometimes appalling in the severity of the strange it puts upon the tongue. So while I do not wonder that your Cuban pianist showed woeful defects in his use of the pedals, I do wonder that, even with his surprising agility, he had sufficient energy to manipulate the keys to the satisfaction of so competent a witness as yourself. It was too bad, but we made up for it later, asserted the other. There was a young girl there who gave us some of Mendelssohn's songs without words. Her expression was simply perfect. I wouldn't have missed it for all the world. And now that I think of it, in a few days, I can let you see for yourself how splendid it was. We persuaded her to encore the songs in the dark, and we got a flashlight photograph of the two of them. Oh, then it was not on the pianoforte she gave them, said the idiot. Oh, no, all labial, returned the genial gentleman. Here Mr. Whitechoker began to look concerned, and whispered something to the schoolmaster, who replied that there were enough other present to cope with the two parties, to the conversation in case of a violent outbreak. I'd be very glad to see the photographs, replied the idiot. Can't I secure copies of them for my collection? I know I have the complete rendering of Home Sweet Home in Kodak Views, as sung by Patty. They are simply wonderful, and they prove what has repeatedly been said of critics, that, in the matter of expression, the superior of Patty has never been seen. I'll try to get them for you, though I doubt it can be done. The artist is a very shy young girl, and does not care to have her efforts given to greater publicity until she is ready to go into music a little more deeply. She is going to read the Moonlight Sonata to us at our next concert. You'd better come. I'm told her gestures bring out the composer's meaning in a manner never as yet equaled. I'll be there, thank you, returned the idiot, and the next time those fellows at the club are down for a pool tournament, I want you to come up and hear them play. It was extraordinary last night to hear the balls dropping one by one, click, 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 as regularly as a metronome into the pockets. One of the finest shots, I am sorry to say, I missed. How did it happen? asked the bibliomaniac. Weren't your ears long enough? It was a kiss shot, and I couldn't hear it, returned the idiot. I think you men are crazy, said the schoolmaster, unable to contain himself any longer. So, observed the idiot calmly, and how do we show our insanity? seeing concerts and hearing games of pool. I take exception to your ruling, returned the imbiber, as my friend the idiot has frequently remarked. You have the peculiarity of a great many men in your profession, who think because they never happen to see or do or hear things as other people do, they may not be seen, done, or heard at all. I saw the concert I attended last night. Our musical club has rooms next to the hospital, and we have to give silent concerts for fear of disturbing the patients. But we are all musicians of sufficient education to understand by a glance of the eye what you would fail to comprehend with fourteen years and a microphone. Very well said, put in the idiot, with a scornful glance at the schoolmaster, and I literally heard the pool tournament. I was dining in a room off the billiard hall, and every shot that was made, with the exception of the one I spoke of, was distinctly audible. You gentlemen, who think you know it all, wouldn't be able to supply a bureau of information at the rate of five minutes a day for an hour on a holiday. Let's go upstairs, he added, turning to the imbiber, where we may discuss our last night's entertainment, apart from this atmosphere of rarefied learning. It makes me faint and the imbiber, who was with difficulty, keeping his lips in proper form, was glad enough to accept the invitation. 
the corks popped to some purpose last night he said later on yes said the idiot for a conspiracy there's nothing so helpful as popping corks end of chapter four chapter five of coffee and repartee this librivox recording is in the public domain coffee and repartee by john kendrick bangs chapter five when you get through with the fire mr pedagog observed the idiot one winter's morning noticing that the ample proportions of the schoolmaster served as a screen to shut off the heat from himself and the genial gentleman who occasionally imbibed i wish you would let us have a little of it indeed if you could conveniently spare so little as one flame for my friend here and myself we'd be much obliged it won't hurt you to cool off a little sir returned the schoolmaster without moving no i am not so much afraid of the injury that may be mine as i am concerned for you if that fire should melt our only refrigerating material i do not know what our good landlady would do is it true as the bibliomaniac asserts that mrs smithers leaves all her milk and butter in your room overnight relying upon your coolness to keep them fresh i never made any such assertion said the bibliomaniac warmly i am not used to having my word disputed returned the idiot with a wink at the genial old gentleman but i never said it and i defy you to prove that i said it returned the bibliomaniac hotly you forget sir said the idiot coolly that you are the one who disputes my assertion that casts the burden of proof on your shoulders of course if you can prove that you never said anything of the sort i withdraw but if you cannot adduce proofs you having doubted my word and publicly at that need not feel hurt if i decline to accept all that you say as gospel you show ridiculous heat said the schoolmaster thank you returned the idiot gracefully and that brings us back to the original proposition that you would do well to show a little yourself good morning gentlemen said mrs smithers entering the room at this morning it's a bright and fresh morning like yourself said the schoolmaster gallantly yes said the idiot with a glance at the clock which registered eight forty five forty five minutes after the breakfast hour very like mrs smithers rather advanced to this the landlady paid no attention but the schoolmaster could not refrain from saying advanced and therefore not backwards like some persons i might name very clever retorted the idiot and really worth rewarding mrs smithers you ought to give mr pedagog a receipt in full for the past six months mr pedagog returned the landlady severely is one of the gentlemen who always have the receipts for the past six months which betrays a very saving disposition accorded the idiot i wish i had all i'd received for six months i'd be a rich man would you now queried the bibliomaniac that is interesting enough how men's ideas differ on the subject of wealth here is the idiot who would consider himself rich with a hundred and fifty dollars in his pocket do you think he gets as much as that put in the schoolmaster viciously five dollars a week is rather high pay for one of his very high indeed agreed the idiot i wish i got that much i might be able to hire a two-legged encyclopedia to tell me everything and have over four seventy-five a week left to spend on opera dress and the poor but honest board mrs smithers provides if my salary was up to the five dollar mark but the trouble is men do not make the fabulous fortunes nowadays with the ease with which you mr pedagog made yours there are no doubt more and greater opportunities to-day than there were in the olden time but there are also more men trying to take advantage of them labor in the business world is badly watered the colleges are turning out more men in a week nowadays than the whole country turned out in a year forty years ago and the quality is so poor that there has been a general reduction of wages all along the line where does the struggler for existence come in when he has to compete with the college-bred youth who for fear of not getting employment anywhere is willing to work for nothing people are not willing to pay for what they can get for nothing i am glad to hear from your lips so complete an admission said the schoolmaster that education is downing ignorance 
"'I am glad to know of your gladness,' returned the idiot. "'I didn't quite say that education was downing ignorance. "'I plead guilty to the charge of holding the belief that unskilled omniscience "'interferes very materially with skilled skialism "'in skilled skialism's efforts to make a living.' "'Then you admit your own superficiality?' asked the schoolmaster, somewhat surprised by the idiot's command of syllables. "'I admit that I do not know it all,' returned the idiot. "'I prefer to go through life feeling that there is yet something for me to learn. It seems to me far better to admit this voluntarily than to have it forced upon me by circumstances, as happened in the case of a college graduate I know, who speculated on Wall Street and lost the hundred dollars that were subsequently put to a good use by the uneducated me.' "'From which you deduce that ignorance is better than education?' queried the schoolmaster scornfully. "'For an omniscient,' returned the idiot, "'you are singularly nearsighted. I have made no such deduction. I arrive at the conclusion, however, that in the chase for the gilded shuckle, the education of experience is better than the coddling of alma mater. In the satisfaction, the personal satisfaction, one derives from a liberal education.' I admit that the sons of alma mater are better off. I never could hope to be so self-satisfied, for instance, as you are. No, observed the schoolmaster, you cannot raise grapes on a thistle farm. Any unbiased observer looking around the table, he added, and noting Mr. Whitechoker, a graduate of Yale, the bibliomaniac, a son of dear old Harvard, the doctor, an honor man of Williams, our legal friend here, a graduate of Columbia, to say nothing of myself, who was graduated with honors at Amherst. Any unbiased observer seeing these, I say, and then seeing you, wouldn't take very long to make up his mind as to whether a man is better off or not for having had a collegiate training. There I must again dispute your assertion, returned the idiot. The unbiased person of whom you speak would say, Here is this gray-haired Amherst man, this book-loving Cambridge boy of fifty-seven years of age, and the reverend graduate of Yale, class of fifty-five, and the other two learned gentlemen of forty-nine summers each, and this poor ignoramus of an idiot, whose only virtue is his modesty, all in the same box. And then he would ask himself, in what way have these sons of Amherst, Yale, Harvard, and so forth, the better of the unassuming idiot? The same box, said the bibliomaniac, what do you mean by that? Just what I say, returned the idiot. The same box, all boarding, all eschewing luxuries of necessity, all paying their bills with difficulty, all sparsely clothed, in reality, all keeping Lent the year through. Verily, he would say, the idiot has the best of it, for he is young. And leaving them chewing the cut of reflection, the idiot departed. "'I thought they were going to land you that time,' said the genial gentleman, who occasionally imbibed later. "'But when I heard you use the word skialism, I knew you were all right. Where did you get it?' "'My chief got it off on me at the office the other day. I happened in a mad moment to try to unload some of my original observations on him, apropos of my getting to the office two hours late, in which it was my endeavor to prove to him that the truly safe and conservative man was always slow.' and so apt to turn up late on occasions. He hopped about the office for a minute or two, and then he informed me that I was an eighteen-carat skylist. I didn't know what he meant, and so I looked it up. And what did he mean? He meant that I took the cake for superficiality, and I guess he was right, replied the idiot with a smile that was not altogether mirthful. End of chapter 5《ハッピーエンドパーティー》これは、LibriVox のコーディングです。ハッピーエンドパーティー by John Kendrick Bangs。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピーエンドパーティー。ハッピー That reminds me, observed the idiot, taking his seat and helping himself copiously to the hominy. A friend of mine, on one of the newspapers, is preparing an article on the antiquity of modern humor. With your kind permission, Mrs. Smithers, I'll take down your remark and hand it over to Mr. Scribbler. 
as a specimen of the modern antique joke. You may not be aware of the fact, but that just is to be found in the rare first edition of the Tales of Babbo, an Italian humorist, who stole everything he wrote from the Greeks. So, queried the bibliomaniac, I've never heard of Babbo, though I had, before the auction sale of my library, a choice copy of the Tales of Poggio, bound in full crushed Levant Morocco, with gilt edges and one or two other Italian Joe Millers in tree calf. I cannot at this moment recall their names. At what period did Bobbo live? inquired the schoolmaster. I don't exactly remember, returned the idiot, assisting the last potato on the table over to his plate. I don't know exactly. It was subsequent to B.C., I think, although I may be wrong. If it was not, you may rest assured, it was prior to B.C. Do you happen to know, inquired the bibliomaniac, the exact date of this rare first edition of which you speak? No, no one knows that, returned the idiot, and for a very good reason. It was printed before dates were invented. The silence which followed this bit of information from the idiot was almost insulting in its intensity. It was a silence that spoke, and what it said was that the idiot's idiocy was colossal, and he, accepting the stillness as a tribute, smiled sweetly. "'What do you think, Mr. Whitechoker?' he said, when he thought the time was ripe for renewing the conversation. "'What do you think of the doctrine that every day will be Sunday by and by?' "'I have only to say, sir,' returned the dominey, pouring a little hot water into his milk, which was a bit too strong for him, that I am a firm believer in the occurrence of a period when Sunday will be to all practical purposes perpetual. That is my belief, too, observed the schoolmaster, but it will be ruinous to our good landlady to provide us with one of her exceptionally fine Sunday breakfasts every morning. Thank you, Mr. Pedagog, returned Mrs. Smithers, with a smile. Can't I give you another cup of coffee? You may, returned the schoolmaster, pained at the lady's grammar but too courteous to call attention to it, save by the emphasis with which he spoke the word may. "'That's one view to take of it,' said the idiot. "'But in case we got a Sunday breakfast every day in the week, we, on the other hand, would get approximately what we pay for. You may fill my cup, too, Mrs. Smithers.' "'The coffee is all gone,' returned the landlady with a snap. "'Then, Mary,' said the idiot gracefully, turning to the maid, you may give me a glass of ice water. It is quite as warm, after all, as the coffee, and not quite so weak. A perpetual Sunday, though, would have its drawbacks, he added, unconscious of the venomous glances of the landlady. You, Mr. Whitechoker, for instance, would be preaching all the time, and in consequence would soon break down. Then the effect upon our eyes from habitually reading the Sunday newspapers day after day would be extremely bad. Nor must we forget that an eternity of Sundays means the elimination from our midst, as the novelists say, of baseball, of circuses, of horse racing, and other necessities of life, unless we are prepared to cast over the puritanical view of Sunday which now prevails. It would substitute Dr. Watts for Annie Rooney. We should lose Tarara Bundier entirely, which is a point in its favor. I don't know about that, said the genial old gentleman. I rather like that song. Did you ever hear me sing it? asked the idiot. Never mind, returned the genial old gentleman hastily. Perhaps you are right after all. The idiot smiled and resumed. Our shops would be perpetually closed, and an enormous loss to the shopkeepers would be sure to follow. Mr. Pedagog's theory that we should have Sunday breakfasts every day is not tenable, for the reason that with a perpetual day of rest, agriculture would die out food products would be killed off by unpulled weeds. In fact, we should go back to that really unfortunate period when women were without dressmakers and man's chief object in life was to christen animals as he met them and to abstain from apples, wisdom, and full dress. The idiot is right, said the bibliomaniac. It would not be a very good thing for the world if every day were Sunday. Wash day is a necessity of life. I am willing to admit this in the face of the fact that wash-day meals are invariably atrocious. Contracts would be void, as a rule, because Sunday is a dies non. A what? asked the idiot. A non-existent day in a business sense, put in the schoolmaster. 
of course said the landlady scornfully any person who knows anything knows that then madam returned the idiot rising from his chair and putting a handful of sweet crackers in his pocket then i must put in a claim for one hundred four dollars from you having been charged at the rate of one dollar a day for a hundred and four dies nons in the two years i have been with you indeed returned the lady sharply very well and i shall put in a counterclaim for the lunches you carry away from your breakfast every morning in your pockets in that event we'll call it off madame returned the idiot as with a courtly bow and a pleasant smile he left the room well i call him off was all the landlady could say as the other guests took their departure and of course the schoolmaster agreed with her End of chapter six chapter seven of coffee and repartee this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Coffee and Repartee by John Kendrick Bangs Chapter 7 Our streets appear to be as far from perfect as ever, said the bibliomaniac with a sigh, as he looked out through the window at the great pools of water that gathered in the basins made by the sinking of the Belgian blocks. We'd better go back to the cowpaths of our fathers. "'There is a great deal in what you say,' observed the schoolmaster. "'The cow-path has all the solidity of Mother Earth, "'and none of the distracting noises we get from the pavements that obtain to-day. "'It is porous and absorbs the moisture. "'The Belgian pavement is leaky and lets it run into our cellars. "'We might do far worse than to go back.' "'Excuse me for having an opinion,' said the idiot. "'But the man of enterprise can't afford to indulge in the luxury of the somnolent cow-path. "'It is too quiet. It conduces to sleep, which is a luxury businessmen cannot afford to indulge in too freely. "'Man must be up and doing. The prosperity of a great city is to my mind directly due to its noise and clatter, "'which effectually put a stop to napping and keep men at all times wide awake.' "'This is a Welsh rabbit idea, I fancy.' said the schoolmaster quietly. He had overheard the idiot's confidences, as revealed to the genial imbiber, regarding the sources of some of his ideas. "'Not at all,' returned the idiot. "'These ideas are beef, not Welsh rabbit. They are the result of much thought. If you will put your mind on the subject, you will see for yourself that there is more in my theory than there is in yours. The prosperity of a locality is the greater as the noise in its vicinity increases.' It is in the quiet neighborhood that man stagnates. Where do we find great business houses? Where do we find great fortunes made? Where do we find the busy bees who make the honey that enables posterity to get into society and do nothing? Do we pick up our millions on the cowpath? I guess not. Do we erect our most princely business houses along the roads laid out by our bovine sister? I think not. Does the man who goes from the cowpath to the White House take the shortcut? I fancy not. He goes over the block pavement. He seeks the home of the noisy, clattering street, before he lands in the shoes of Washington. The man who sticks to the cowpath may be able to drink milk, but he never wears diamonds. All that you say is very true, but it is not based on any fundamental principle. It is so because it happens to be so, returned the schoolmaster. If it were man's habit to have the streets laid out on the old cowpath principle in his cities, he would be quite as energetic, quite as prosperous as he is now. No fundamental principle involved? There is the fundamental principle of all business success involved, said the idiot, warming up to his subject. What is the basic quality in the good business man? Alertness. What is alertness? Wide awakishness. In this town it is impossible for a man to sleep after a stated hour, and for no other reason than the clatter of the pavements prevents him. As a promoter of alertness, where is your cowpath? Cowpaths of the Catskills, and we all know the mountains are riddled by em. didn't keep Rip Van Winkle awake, and I'll wager Mr. Whitechoker here a year's board that there isn't a man in his congregation who can sleep a half hour, much less twenty years, with Broadway within hearing distance. I tell you, Mr. Pedagog, he continued, it is the man from the cowpath who gets bunkoed. It's the man from the cowpath who can't make a living even out of what he calls his New York store. It is the man from the cowpath 
who rejoices because he can sell ten dollars worth of sheep's wool for five dollars and is happy when he goes to meeting dressed up in a four-dollar suit of clothes that has cost him twenty your theory my young friend observed the schoolmaster is as fragile as this cup tapping his coffee cup the countryman of whom you speak is up and doing long before you or i or your successful merchant who has waxed great on noise as you put it is awake if the early bird catches the worm what becomes of your theory the early bird does get the bait replied the idiot but he does not catch the fish and i'll offer the board another wager that the belgian block merchant is wider awake at eight a m when he first opens his eyes then his suburban brother who gets up at five is all day it's the extent to which the eyes are open that counts and as for your statement that the fact that prosperity and noisy streets go hand in hand is true only because it happens to be so that is an argument which may be applied to any truth in existence i am because i happen to be not because i am you are what you are because you are because if you were not you would not be what you are your logic is delightful said the schoolmaster scornfully i strive to please replied the idiot but i do agree with the bibliomaniac that our streets are far from perfection he added in my opinion they should be laid in strata the ground floor should be the sewers and the telegraph pipes above this should be the water mains then a layer for trucks then a broad stratum for carriages above which should be a promenade for pedestrians the promenade for pedestrians should be divided into four sections one for persons of leisure one for those in a hurry one for peddlers and one for beggars highly original said the bibliomaniac and so cheap added the schoolmaster in no part of the world said the idiot in response to the last comment do we get something for nothing of course this scheme would be costly but it would increase prosperity <laughs> laughed the schoolmaster satirically laugh away but you cannot gainsay my point our prosperity would increase for we should not be always excavating to get at our pipes our surface cars with a clear track would gain for us rapid transit our truck drivers would not be subjected to the temptations of stopping by the wayside to overturn a coupe or to run down a pedestrian our fine equipages would be in consequence need fewer repairs and as for the pedestrians the beggars if relegated to themselves would be forced out of business as would also the street peddlers the men in a hurry would not be delayed by loungers beggars and peddlers and the loungers would derive inestimable benefit from the arrangement in the saving of wear and tear on their clothes and minds by contact with the busy world it would be delightful acceded the schoolmaster particularly on sundays when we were all loungers yes replied the idiot it would be delightful then especially in summer when covered by an awning to shield promenaders from the sun mr pedagog sighed and the bibliomaniac wearily declining a second cup of coffee left the table with the doctor earnestly discussing with that worthy gentleman the causes of weak-mindedness End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Coffee and Repartee. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Coffee and Repartee by John Kendrick Bangs. Chapter Eight. There's a friend of mine up near Riverdale, said the idiot as he unfolded his napkin and let his bill flutter from it to the floor, who's tried to make a name for himself in literature what's his name asked the bibliomaniac interested at once that's just the trouble he hasn't made it yet replied the idiot he hasn't succeeded in his courtship of the muse and beyond himself and a few friends his name is utterly unknown what work has he tried queried the schoolmaster pouring unadmonished two portions of skimmed milk over his oatmeal a little of everything first he wrote a novel it had an immense circulation and he only lost three hundred dollars on it all of his friends took a copy i've got one that he gave me and i believe two hundred newspapers were fortunate enough to secure the book for review his father bought two and tried to obtain the balance of the edition but didn't have enough money that was gratifying but gratification is more apt to deplete than to strengthen a bank account i had not expected so extraordinarily wise an observation from one so unusually unwise said the schoolmaster coldly 
thank you returned the idiot but i think your remark is rather contradictory you would naturally expect wise observations from the unusually unwise that is if you're teaching that the expression unusually unwise is but another form of the expression usually wise is correct but as i was saying when the genial instructor of youth interrupted me with his flattery continued the idiot gratification is gratifying but not filling so my friend concluded that he had better give up novel writing and try jokes he kept at that a year and managed to clear his postage stamps his jokes were good but too classic for the tastes of the editors editors are peculiar they have no respect for age particularly in the matter of jests some of my friend's jokes had seemed good enough for plutarch to print when he had a publisher at his mercy but they didn't seem to suit the high and mighty products of this age who sit in judgment on such things in the comic paper offices so he gave up jokes does he still know you asked the landlady yes madame observed the idiot then he hasn't given up all jokes she retorted with fine scorn tee hee hee laughed the schoolmaster pretty good mrs smithers pretty good yes said the idiot that is good and by jove it differs from your butter mrs smithers because it's entirely fresh it's good enough to print and i don't think the butter is what did your friend do next asked mr whitechoker he was employed by a funeral director in philadelphia to write obituary verses for memorial cards and was he successful for a time but he lost his position because of an error made by a careless compositor in a marble yard he had written here lies the hero of a hundred fights approximated he a perfect man he fought for country and his country's rights and in the hottest battles led the van fine in sentiment and in execution observed mr whitechoker truly so returned the idiot but when the compositor in the marble yard got it engraved on the monument my friend was away and when the army post that was to pay the bill received the monument the quatrain read here lies the hero of a hundred flights approximated he a perfect one he fought his country and his country's rights and in the hottest battles led the run awful ejaculated the minister dreadful said the landlady forgetting to be sarcastic what happened asked the schoolmaster he was bounced of course without a cent of pay and the company failed the next week so he couldn't make anything by suing for what they owed him mighty hard luck said the bibliomaniac very but there was one bright side to the case observed the idiot he managed to sell both versions of the quatrain afterwards for five dollars he sold the original one to a religious weekly for a dollar and got four dollars for the other one from a comic paper then he wrote an anecdote about the whole thing for a sunday newspaper and got three dollars more out of it and what is your friend doing now asked the doctor oh he's making a mint of money now but no name in literature yes he writes advertisements on salary returned the idiot he is writing now a recommendation of tooth powder in indian dialect why didn't he try writing an epic said the bibliomaniac because replied the idiot the one aim of his life has been to be original and he couldn't reconcile that with epic poetry at which remark the landlady stooped over and recovering the idiot's bill from under the table called the maid and ostentatiously requested her to hand it to the idiot he taking a cigarette from his pocket thanked the maid for the attention and rolling the slip into a taper thoughtfully struck one end of it into the alcohol light under the coffee pot and lighting the cigarette with it walked nonchalantly from the room end of chapter eight chapter nine of coffee and repartee this librivox recording is in the public domain coffee and repartee by john kendrick bangs chapter nine i've just been reading a book began the idiot i thought you looked rather pale said the schoolmaster yes returned the idiot cheerfully it made me feel pale it was about the pleasures of country life and when i contrasted rural blessedness as it was there depicted with urban life as we live it i felt as if my youth were being thrown away i still feel as if i were wasting my sweetness on the desert air why don't you move 
queried the bibliomaniac suggestively. If I were purely selfish, I should do so at once, but I am, like my good friend Mr. Whitechoker, a slave to duty. I deem it my duty to stay here to keep the schoolmaster fully informed in the various branches of knowledge which are day by day opened up, many of which seem to be so far beyond the reach of one of his conservative habits, to assist Mr. Whitechoker in his crusades against vice at this table and elsewhere, to give the bibliomaniac the benefit of my advice in regard to those precious little tomes he no longer buys, to make life worth the living for all of you, to say nothing of enabling Mrs. Smithers to keep up the extraordinarily high standard of this house by means of the hard-earned stipend I pay to her every Monday morning. "'Every Monday?' queried the schoolmaster. "'Every Monday,' returned the idiot. "'That is, of course, every Monday that I pay. The things one gets to eat in the country.' the air one breathes, the utter freedom from restraint, the thousand and more things one enjoys, in the suburbs, that are not attainable here. It is these that make my heart yearn for the open. "'Well, it's all rot,' said the schoolmaster impatiently. "'Country life is ideal only in books. Books do not tell of running for trains through blinding snowstorms. Writers do not expatiate on the delights of waking on cold winter nights, and finding your piano and parlor furniture afloat because of bursted pipes with the plumber like sheridan at winchester twenty miles away they are dumb on the subject of the ecstasy one feels when pushing a twenty-pound lawn-mower up and down a weed-patch at the end of a wearisome hot summer's day they are silent don't get excited mr pedagog please interrupted the idiot i am not contemplating leaving you and mrs smithers but i do pine for a little garden of my own where i could raise an occasional can of tomatoes i dream sometimes of getting milk fresh from the pump instead of twenty-four hours after it has been drawn as we do here in my musings it seems to me to be almost idyllic to have known a spring chicken in his infancy to have watched a hind quarter of lamb gambolling about its native heath before its muscles became adamant and before chopped-up celery tops steeped in vinegar were poured upon it in the hope of hypnotizing boarders into the belief that spring lamb and mint sauce lay before them. What care I how hard it is to rise every morning before six in winter to thaw out the boiler so long as the night coming finds me seated in the genial glow of the gas-log? What man is he that would complain of having to bail out his cellar every week, if, on the other hand— that cellar gains thereby a fertility that keeps its floor sheeny, soft, and green, an interior tennis court from spring to spring, causing the gladsome click of the lawnmower to be heard within its walls all through the still watches of the winter day. I tell you, sir, it is the life to lead, that of our rural brother. I do not believe that in this whole vast city there is a cellar like that, an indoor garden patch, as it were." no returned the doctor and it is a good thing there isn't there is enough sickness in the world without bringing any of your rus ideas in herb i've lived in the country sir and i assure you it is not what is written up to be country life is misery melancholy and malaria you must have struck a profitable section doctor returned the idiot taking possession of three steaming buckwheat cakes to dismay of Mr. Whitechoker, who was about to reach out for them himself. And I should have supposed that your good business sense would have restrained you from leaving. Then the countryman is poor, always poor, continued the doctor, ignoring the idiot's sarcastic comments. Ah, that accounts for it, observed the idiot. I see why you did not stay, for what shall it profit a man to save a patient if practice, like virtue, is to be its own reward? Your suggestion, sir, retorted the doctor, betrays an unhealthy frame of mind. That's all right, doctor, returned the idiot, but please do not diagnose the case any further. I can't afford an expert opinion as to my mental condition, but to return to our subject, you two gentlemen appear to have an unhappy experience in country life quite different from those of a friend of mine who owns a farm. He doesn't have to run for trains. He is independent of plumbers, because the only pipes in his house are for smoking purposes. The farm produces corn enough to keep his family supplied all the year round, and to sell a balance at a profit. Oats and wheat are harvested to an extent which keeps the cattle, and declares dividends besides. He never suffers from the cold or heat. He 
he is never afraid of losing his house or barns by fire because the whole fire department of the neighboring village is to a man in love with the housekeeper's daughter and is always on hand in force the chickens are the envy and pride of the country and there are so many of them that they have to take turns in going to roost the pigs are the most intelligent of their kind and are so happy they never grunt in fact everything is lovely and cheap the only thing that hangs high being the goose quite an ideal no doubt put in the schoolmaster scornfully i suppose his is one of those model farms with steam pipes under the walks to melt the snow in winter and of course there is a vein of coal growing right up in his furnace ready to be lit yes observed the bibliomaniac and no doubt the chickens lay eggs in every style poached fried scrambled and boiled the weeds in the garden grow so fast i suppose that they put themselves up by the roots and if there is anything left undone at the end of the day i presume tramps in dress suits and courtly manner spring out of the ground and finish up for him i'll bet he's not on good terms with his neighbors if he has everything you speak of in such perfection these farmers get frightfully jealous of each other asserted the doctor with a positiveness that seemed to be born of experience he never quarrelled with one of them in his life returned the idiot he doesn't know them well enough to quarrel with them in fact i doubt if he ever sees them at all he's very exclusive of course he is a born farmer to get everything the way he has it suggested mrs smithers no he isn't he's a broker said the idiot and a very successful one i see him on the street every day does he employ a man to run the farm asked the clergyman no returned the idiot he has too much sense and too few dollars to do any such foolish thing as that it must be one of those self-winding stock farms put in the schoolmaster scornfully but i don't see how he can be a successful broker and make money off his farm at the same time your statements do not agree either you said he never had to run for trains well he never has returned the idiot calmly he never goes near his farm he doesn't have to it's leased to the husband of the housekeeper whose daughter has a crush on the fire department he takes his pay in produce and gets more than if he took it in cash on the basis of the new york vegetable market then you have got us into an argument about country life that ends began the schoolmaster indignantly that ends where it leaves off retorted the idiot departing with a smile on his lips he's an idiot from idaho asserted the bibliomaniac yes but i'm afraid idiocy is a little contagious observed the doctor with a grin and sidelong glance at the schoolmaster end of chapter nine chapter ten of coffee and repartee this librivox recording is in the public domain coffee and repartee by john kendrick bangs chapter ten good morning gentlemen said the idiot as he seated himself at the breakfast table and glanced over his mail good morning yourself returned the poet you have an unusually large number of letters this morning all checks i hope yes replied the idiot all checks of one kind or another mostly checks on ambition otherwise rejections from my friends the editors you don't mean to say that you write for the papers put in the schoolmaster with an incredulous smile i try to returned the idiot meekly if the papers don't take em i find them useful in curing my genial friend who imbibes of insomnia what do you write advertisements queried the bibliomaniac no advertisement writing is an art to which i dare not aspire it's too great a tax on the brain replied the idiot tax on what asked the doctor he was going to squelch the idiot the brain returned the latter not ready to be squelched it's a little thing people use to think with doctor i'd advise you to get one then he added i write poems and foreign letters mostly i did not know that you had ever been abroad said the clergyman i never have then how may i ask said mr whitechoker severely how can you write foreign letters with my stub pen of course replied the idiot how did you suppose with an oyster knife the clergyman sighed i should like to hear some of your poems said the poet very well returned the idiot 
here's one that has just returned from the bengal monthly it's about a writer who died some years ago shakespeare's his name you've heard of shakespeare haven't you mr pedagog he added then as there was no answer he read the verse which was as follows settled yes shakespeare wrote the plays tis clear to me lord bacon claims condemned before the bar he did not have penned what fools these mortals be but more correct what fools these mortals are that's not bad said the poet thanks returned the idiot i wish you were an editor i wrote that last spring and it has been coming back to me at the rate of once a week ever since it is too short said the bibliomaniac it's an epigram said the idiot how many yards long do you think epigrams should be the bibliomaniac scorned to reply i agree with the bibliomaniac said the schoolmaster it is too short people want greater quantity well here is quantity for you said the idiot quantity as she is not wanted by nine comic papers i won't of this poem is called the turning of the worm how hard my fate perhaps you'll gather in my dearest reader when i tell you that i entered into this fair world a twin the one was spare enough the other fat i was of course the lean one of the two the homular as well and consequently in ecstasy over jim my parents flew and good of me was spoken accidentally as boys we went to school and jim of course was ere his favorite teacher and ranked among the lads renowned for moral force whilst i was every day right soundly spanked jim had an angel face but there he stopped i never knew a lad who'd sin so oft and look so like a branch of heaven lopped from off the parent trunk that grows aloft i seemed an imp indeed twas often said that i resembled much beelzebub my face was freckled and my hair was red the kind of looking boy that men call scrub kind deeds however were my constant thought in everything i did the best i could i said my prayers thrice daily and i sought in all my ways to do the right and good on saturdays i do my monday sums while jim would spend the day in search of fun he'd sneak away and steal the neighbor's plums and strange to say to earth was never run whilst i when study time was haply through would seek my brother in the neighbor's orchard would find the neighbor there with anger blue and as the thieving culprit would be tortured the sums i'd done he'd steal this lad forsaken then change my work so that a paltry four would be my mark whilst he had overtaken the maximum and all the prizes bore in later years we loved the self-same maid we sent her little presents sweet bouquets for which alas twas i that always paid and jim the maid now honors and obeys we entered politics in different roles and for a minor office each did run twas i was left left badly at the polls because of fishy things that jim had done when jim went into business and failed i signed his notes and freed him from the strife which bankruptcy and ruin hath entailed on them that led a queer financial life then penniless i learned that jim had set aside before his failure hard to tell a half a million dollars on his pet his mrs jim the former lovely now that wearied me of jim it might be right for one to bear another's cross but i quite fail to see it in its proper light if that's the rule man should be guided by and since a fate perverse has had the wit to mix us up so that the one's deserts upon the shoulders of the other sit no matter how the other one it hurts i am resolved to take some mortal's life just when or where or how i do not wreck so long as law will end this horrid strife and twist my dear twin brother's sinful neck there said the idiot putting down the manuscript how is that i don't like it said mr whitechoker it is immoral and vindictive you should accept the hardships of life no matter how unjust the conclusion of your poem horrifies me sir i have you tried your hand at dialect poetry asked the doctor 
"'Yes, once,' said the idiot. "'I sent it to the Great Western Weekly. "'Oh, yes, here it is, sent back with thanks. "'It's an octet, written in cigar-box dialect.' "'In what?' asked the poet. "'Cigar-box dialect. Here it is. "'Oh, Manuel, Garcia Alonso, Colorado Especial H. Clay, Invincible Flora Alfonso, Cigarette Penatella El Rey, Victoria Reina Selectas, O Tufer Madura Grande, O Conscious Oscuro Perfectas, You Drive All My Sorrows Away. Ingenious but vicious, said the schoolmaster, who does not smoke. Again, thanks. How is this for a sonnet? said the idiot. When to the sessions of sweet silent thought, I summon up remembrance of things past. I sigh the lack of many a thing I sought, and with old woes new wail my dear time's waste. Then can I drown an eye, unused to flow, for precious friends hid in death's dateless night, and weep afresh love's long since cancelled woe, and moan the expense of many a vanished sight. Then can I grieve at grievances foregone, and heavily from woe to woe tell o'er the sad account of four bemoaned moan, which now I pay as if not paid before. But if the while I think of thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. It is bosh, said the schoolmaster. The poet smiled quietly. Perfect bosh, repeated the schoolmaster, and only shows how in weak hand so beautiful a thing as the sonnet can be made ridiculous what's wrong with it asked the idiot it doesn't contain any thought or if it does no one can tell what the thought is your rhymes are atrocious your phraseology is ridiculous the whole thing is bad you'll never get anybody to print it i do not intend to try said the idiot meekly you are wise said the schoolmaster to take my advice for once no it is not your advice that restrains me said the idiot dryly it is the fact that this sonnet has already been printed in the name of letters where cried the schoolmaster in the collected works of william shakespeare replied the idiot quietly the poet laughed mrs smithers eyes filled with tears and the schoolmaster for once had absolutely nothing to say end of chapter ten Chapter 11 of Coffee and Repartee. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Coffee and Repartee by John Kendrick Bangs. Chapter 11. Do you believe, Mr. White Choker, said the idiot, taking his place at the table and holding his plate up to the light, apparently to see whether or not it was immaculate, whereat the landlady sniffed contemptuously. Do you believe that the love of money is the root of all evil? "'I have always been of that impression,' returned Mr. White Choker pleasantly. "'In fact, I am sure of it,' he added. "'There is no evil thing in this world, sir, that cannot be traced back to a point where greed is found to be its mainspring and the source of its strength.' "'Then how do you reconcile this with the scriptural story of the forbidden fruit? Do you think the apples referred to were figures of speech, the true import of which—' was that Adam and Eve had their eyes on the original surplus? Well, of course, there you begin to, uh, you seem to me to be going back to the, er, uh, the, uh, original root of all evil, prompted the idiot calmly. Precisely, returned Mr. White Choker with a sigh of relief. Mrs. Smithers, I think I'll have a dash of hot water in my coffee this morning. Then, with a nervous glance towards the idiot, he added, addressing the bibliomaniac. I think it looks like rain. Referring to the coffee, Mr. White Choker? queried the idiot, not disposed to let go of his victim quite so easily. Ah, I don't quite follow you, replied the minister with some annoyance. You said something looked like rain, and I asked you if the thing you referred to was the coffee, for I was disposed to agree with you, said the idiot. I am sure, put in Mrs. Smithers, that a gentleman of Mr. White Choker's refinement would not make 
any such insinuation, sir. He is not the man to quarrel with what is set before him. I ask your pardon, madam, returned the idiot politely. I hope that I am not the man to quarrel with my food either. Indeed, I make it a rule to avoid unpleasantness of all sorts, particularly with the weakness under which category we find your coffee. I simply wish to know to what Mr. Whitechoker refers when he says it looks like rain. I mean, of course, said the minister, with as much calmness as he could command, and that was not much. I mean the day. The day looks as if it might be rainy. Any one with a modicum of brain knows what you meant, Mr. Whitechoker, volunteered the schoolmaster. Certainly, observed the idiot, scraping the butter from his toast. But to those who have more than a modicum of brains, my reverend friend's remark was not entirely clear. If I am talking of cotton, and a gentleman chooses to state that it looks like snow, I know exactly what he means. He doesn't mean that the day looks like snow, however. He refers to the cotton. Mr. Whitechoker, talking about coffee, chooses to state that it looks like rain, which it undoubtedly does. I, realizing that, as Mrs. Smithers says, it is not the gentleman's habit to attack too violently the food which is set before him, manifest some surprise, and, giving the gentleman the benefit of the doubt, afford him an opportunity to set himself right. Change the subject, said the bibliomaniac, curtly. With pleasure, answered the idiot, filling his glass with cream. We'll change the subject, or the object, or anything you choose. We'll have another breakfast, or another variety of biscuits, frappe, anything, in short, to keep peace at the table. Tell me, Mr. Pedagog, he added, is the use of the word it in the sentence it looks like rain perfectly correct? I don't know why it is not, returned the schoolmaster uneasily. He was not at all desirous of parleying with the idiot. And is it correct to suppose that it refers to the day? Is the day supposed to look like rain, or do we simply use it to express a condition which confronts us? It refers to the latter, of course. Then the full text of Mr. Whitechoker's remark is, I suppose, that the rainy condition of the atmosphere which confronts us looks like rain. Oh, I suppose so, sighed the schoolmaster wearily. Rather than an unnecessary sort of statement that, continued the idiot, it's something like asserting that a man looks like himself, or, as in the case of a child's primer, see the cat? Yes, I see the cat. What is the cat? The cat is a cat. Scat cat. At even this, Mrs. Smithers smiled. I don't agree with Mr. Pedagog, put in the bibliomaniac after a pause. Here the schoolmaster shook his head warningly at the bibliomaniac, as if to indicate that he was not in good form. So I observe, remarked the idiot. You have upset him completely. See how Mr. Pedagog trembles, he added, addressing the genial gentleman who occasionally imbibed. I don't mean that way, sneered the bibliomaniac, bound to set Mr. Whitechoker straight. I mean that the word it, as employed in that sentence, stands for day. The day looks like rain. Did you ever see a day? queried the idiot. Certainly I have, returned the bibliomaniac. What does it look like? was the calmly put question. The bibliomaniac's impatience was here almost too great for safety, and the manner in which his face colored aroused considerable interest in the breast of the doctor, who was a good deal of a specialist in apoplexy. Was it a whole day you saw, or only a half day? persisted the idiot. You may think you are very funny, retorted the bibliomaniac. I think you are. Now don't get angry, returned the idiot. There are two or three things I do not know, and I'm anxious to learn. I'd like to know how a day looks to one to whom it is a visible object. If it is visible, is it tangible? And if so, how does it feel? The visible is always tangible, asserted the schoolmaster recklessly. How about a red-hot stove, or a manifest indignation, or a view from a mountaintop? or, as in the case of the young man in the novel, who suddenly waked, and looking anxiously about him saw no one, returned the idiot imperturbably. Tut! ejaculated the bibliomaniac. If I had brains like yours, I'd blow them out. Yes, I think you would, observed the idiot, folding up his napkin. You're just the man to do a thing like that. I believe you'd blow out the gas in your bedroom, if there wasn't a sign over it requesting you not to. And filling his matchbox from the landlady's mantle supply, 
the idiot hurried from the room and soon after left the house end of chapter eleven chapter twelve of coffee and repartee this librivox recording is in the public domain coffee and repartee by john kendrick bangs chapter twelve if my father hadn't met with reverses the idiot began did you really have a father interrupted the schoolmaster i thought you were one of these self-made idiots how terrible it must be for a man to think that he is responsible for you yes rejoined the idiot my father finds it rather hard to stand up under his responsibility for me but he is a brave old gentleman and he manages to bear the burden very well with the aid of my mother for i have a mother too mr pedagog a womanly mother she is too with all the natural follies such as fondness for and belief in her boy why it would soften your heart to see how she looks on me she thinks i am the most everlastingly brilliant man she ever knew excepting father of course who has always been a hero of heroes in her eyes because he never rails at misfortune never spoke an unkind word to her in his life and just lives gently along and waiting for the end of all things do you think it is right in you to deceive your mother in this way making her think you a young napoleon of intellect when you know you are an idiot observed the bibliomaniac with a twinkle in his eye why certainly i do returned the idiot calmly it's my place to make the old folks happy if i can and if thinking me nineteen different kinds of a genius is going to fill my mother's heart with happiness i'm going to let her think it what's the use of destroying other people's idols even if we do know them to be hollow mockeries do you think you do a praiseworthy act for instance when you kick over the heathen's stone gods and leave him without any at all you may not have noticed it but i have that it is easier to pull down an idol than it is to rear an ideal i have had idols shattered myself and i haven't found that the pedestals they used to occupy have been rented since they are there yet and empty standing as monuments to what once seemed good to me and i'm no happier nor no better for being disillusioned so it is with my mother i let her go on and think me perfect it does her good and it does me good because it makes me try to live up to that idea of hers as to what i am if she had the same opinion of me that we all have she'd be the most miserable woman in the world we don't all think so badly of you said the doctor rather softened by the idiot's remarks no put in the bibliomaniac you are all right you breathe normally and you have nice blue eyes you are graceful and pleasant to look upon and if you'd been born dumb we'd esteem you very highly it is only your manners and your theories that we don't like but even in these we are disposed to believe that you are a well-meaning child that is precisely the way to put it assented the schoolmaster you are harmless even when most annoying for my own part i think the most objectionable feature about you is that you suffer from that unfortunately not uncommon malady extreme youth you are young for your age and if you only wouldn't talk i think we should get on famously together you overwhelm me with your compliments said the idiot i am sorry i am so young but i cannot be brought to believe that that is my own fault one must live to attain age and how the deuce can one live when one boards as no one ventured to reply to this question the force of which very evidently however was fully appreciated by mrs smithers the idiot continued youth is thrust upon us in our infancy and must be endured until such a time as fate permits us to account ourselves cured it swoops down upon us when we have neither the strength nor the brains to resent it of course there are some superior persons in this world who never were young mr pedagog i doubt not was ushered into this world with all three sets of teeth cut and not wailing as most infants are but discussing the most abstruse philosophical problems his fairy stories were told him if ever in words of ten syllables and his father's first remark to him was doubtless an inquiry as to his opinion on the subject of latin and greek in our colleges it's all right to be this kind of a baby if you like that sort of thing for my part i rejoice to think that there was once a day when i thought my father a mean-spirited assassin because he wouldn't tie a string to the moon and let me make it rise and set as suited my sweet will 
babies of mr pedagog's sort are unfortunately like angels visits few and far between in spite of his stand in the matter though i can't help thinking there was a great deal of truth in a rhyme a friend of mine got off on youth it fits the case he said youth is a state of being we attain in early years to some tis but a crime and like the mumps most aged men complain it can't be caught alas a second time your rhymes are interesting and your reasoning as usual is faulty said the schoolmaster i passed a very pleasant childhood though it was a childhood devoted as you have insinuated to serious rather than to flippant pursuits i wasn't particularly fond of tag and hide-and-seek nor do i think that even as an infant i ever cried for the moon it would have expanded your chest if you had mr pedagog observed the idiot quietly so it would but i never found myself short-winded sir retorted the schoolmaster with some acerbity that is evident but go on said the idiot you never passed a childish youth nor a youthful childhood and therefore what therefore in my present condition i am normally contented i have no youthful follies to look back upon no indiscretions to regret i never knowingly told a lie and all of which proves that you never were young put in the idiot and you will excuse me if i say it but my father is the model for me rather than so exalted a personage as yourself he is still young though turned seventy and i don't believe on his own account there ever was a boy who played hooky more who prevaricated oftener who purloined others fruits with greater frequency than he he was guilty of every crime in the calendar of youth and if there is one thing that delights him more than another it is to sit on a winter's night before the crackling log and tell us yarns about his youthful follies and his boyhood indiscretions but is he normally a happy man queried the schoolmaster no ah no he's an abnormally happy man because he's got his follies and indiscretions to look back upon and not forward to uh hum said mrs smithers dear me ejaculated mr whitechoker Mr. Pedagog said nothing, and the breakfast room was soon deserted. End of chapter 12、Chapter、13 of Coffee and Repartee. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Coffee and Repartee by John Kendrick Bangs. Chapter 13 there was an air of suppressed excitement about mrs smithers and mr pedagog as they sat down to breakfast something had happened but just what that something was no one as yet knew although the genial old gentleman had a sort of notion as to what it was pedagog has been good-natured enough for an engaged man for nearly a week now he whispered to the idiot who had asked him what he supposed was up and i have a half idea that mrs s has at last brought him to the point of proposing it's the other way i imagine returned the idiot you don't really think she has rejected him do you queried the genial old gentleman oh no not by a great deal i mean that i think it very likely that he has brought her to the point this is leap year you know said the idiot well if i were a betting man which i haven't been since night before last i'd lay you a wager that they're engaged said the old gentleman i'm glad you've given up betting rejoined the idiot because i'm sure i'd take the bet if you offered it and then i believe i'd lose we are to have philadelphia spring chickens this morning gentlemen said mrs smithers beaming upon all at the table it's a special treat which we all appreciate my dear mrs smithers observed the idiot with a courteous bow to his landlady and by the way why is it that philadelphia spring chickens do not appear until autumn do you suppose is it because philadelphia spring doesn't come around until it is autumn everywhere else no i think not said the doctor i think it is because philadelphia spring chickens are not sufficiently hardened to be able to stand the strain of exportation much before september or else philadelphia people do not get so sated with such delicacies as to permit any of the crop to go into other than philadelphia markets before that period for my part i simply love them 
so do i said the idiot and if mrs smithers will pardon me for expressing a preference for any especial part of the piece de resistance i will say to her that if in helping me she will give me two drumsticks a pair of second joints and plenty of the white meat i shall be very happy you ought to have said so yesterday said the schoolmaster with a surprisingly genial laugh then mrs smithers could have prepared an individual chicken for you that would be too much returned the idiot and i should really hesitate to eat too much spring chicken i never did it in my life and don't know what the effect would be would it be harmful doctor i really do not know how it would be answered the doctor in all my wide experience i have never found a case of the kind it's very rarely that one gets too much spring chicken said mr whitechoker i haven't had any experience with patients as my friend the doctor has but i have lived in many boarding-houses and i have never yet known of any one even getting enough well perhaps we shall have all we want this morning said mrs smithers i hope so at any rate for i wish this day to be a memorable one in our house mr pedagog has something to tell you john will you announce it now did you hear that whispered the idiot she called him john yes said the genial old gentleman i didn't know pedagog had a first name before certainly my dear that is my very dear mrs smithers stammered the schoolmaster getting red in the face the fact is gentlemen ahem, i er we er that that is of course er mrs smithers has er ahem, mrs smithers has asked me to be her uh, er i should say i have asked mrs smithers to be my husband my wife and er she hurrah cried the idiot jumping up from the table and grasping mr pedagog by the hand hurrah you've got in ahead of us old man but we are just as glad when we think of your good fortune your gain may be our loss but what of that where the happiness of our dear landlady is at stake mrs smithers glanced coyly at the idiot and smiled thank you said the schoolmaster you are welcome said the idiot mrs smithers you will also permit me to felicitate you upon this happy event i who have so often differed with mr pedagog upon matters of human knowledge am forced to admit that upon this occasion he has shown such eminently good sense that you are fortunate indeed to have won him again i thank you said the schoolmaster you are a very sensible person yourself my dear idiot perhaps my failure to appreciate you at times in the past has been due to your brilliant qualities which have so dazzled me that i have been unable to see you as you really are here are the chickens said mrs smithers ah ejaculated the idiot what lucky fellows we are to be sure i hope mrs smithers now that mr pedagog has cut us all out you will at least be a sister to the rest of us and let us live at home there is to be no change said mrs smithers at least i hope not except that mr pedagog will take a more active part in the management of our home i don't envy him that said the idiot we shall be severe critics and it will be hard work for him to manage affairs better than you did mrs smithers mary get me a larger cup for the idiot's coffee said mrs smithers let's all retire from business suggested the idiot after the other guests had expressed their satisfaction with the turn affairs had taken let's retire from business and change the smithers home for boarders into an educational institution for what purpose queried the bibliomaniac everything is so lovely now explained the idiot that i feel as though i never wanted to leave the house again even to win a fortune if we turn it into a college and instruct youth we need never go outside the front door excepting for pleasure where will the money and the instructors come from asked mr whitechoker money from pupils and after we get going maybe somebody will endow us as for instructors i think we know enough to be instructors ourselves replied the idiot for instance pedagog's university john pedagog president alonzo b whitechoker chaplain mrs smithers pedagog matron for professor of bell's letters the bibliomaniac assisted by the poet medical lectures by dr capsule chemistry taught by our genial friend who occasionally imbibes chair in general information your humble servant why we would be overrun with pupils and money in less than a year a very good idea returned mr pedagog 
i have often thought that a nice little school could be started here to advantage though i must confess that i had different ideas on the subject of the instructors you my dear idiot would be a great deal more useful as a professor emeritus hm said the idiot it sounds mighty well i've no doubt i should like it what is a professor emeritus mr pedagog he is a professor for who is paid a salary for doing nothing the whole table joined in a laugh the idiot included by jove mr pedagog he said as soon as he could speak you are just dead right about that that's the place of places for me salary and nothing to do oh how i'd love it the rest of the breakfast was eaten in silence the spring chickens were too good and too plentiful to admit of much waste of time in conversation at the conclusion of the meal the idiot rose from the table and after again congratulating mr pedagog and his fiancée announced that he was going to see his employer on sunday queried mrs smithers yes i want him to write me a recommendation as a man who can do nothing beautifully and why pray asked mr pedagog i'm going to apply to the trustees of columbia college the first thing tomorrow morning for an emeritus professorship for if anybody can do nothing and draw money for it gracefully i'm the man wall street is too wearying on my nerves he replied and in a moment he was gone i like him said mrs smithers so do i said mr pedagog he isn't half the idiot he thinks he is the end the end of chapter thirteen of coffee and repartee and the end of coffee and repartee by john kendrick bangs read by darrell war in california u s a